Welcome to our webinar today, Inside the Threats Protecting Data Through eDiscovery. When it comes to your data, if it's valuable, it's vulnerable. That's just the reality of doing business in the information age. The eDiscovery process by its nature involves collecting and storing volumes of sensitive and valuable data. And the data itself may be sensitive in that an intentional or accidental compromise could cause serious damage to your organisation's interest and reputation. The data also has high inherent value to your organisation because it's essentially your ability to defend or prosecute a legal matter. Protecting this data from intentional or unintentional disclosure must be a priority for your organisation. Consider the recent Panama Papers scandal. While the informant may or may not have been an insider, you can bet the ensuing litigation that arises from this breach will undoubtedly expose a massive amount of the sensitive data just like the Enron case did. And looking at insider behaviour specifically, thanks to people like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden, while often the target is not related to discovery data, rather things like a financial engineer at a hedge fund who stole proprietary algorithms, it could just as easily be data collected for discovery that is targeted. If you think about it, data collected for discovery, whether it be for legal or regulatory reasons, is such a neat little parcel of the company's most sensitive data, and it can be much more exposed when outside its normal storage. To help you mitigate the insider risk today, we have assembled a panel of experts to explore the issues and opportunities, and to provide some actionable insights for securing your data through the e-discovery life cycle. I'd like to welcome Michael Jones, Head of Project Services from Inter Allison. Michael, did you want to let us know a little bit about yourself? Hi, and thank you, Angela. I'm the Head of Project Services here at Minter Ellison. Project Services has a 23-year history with our firm, providing our clients with consulting and management services in relation to legal technology, document management and litigation support. I bring 20 years experience to the role with qualifications in both law and IT. Of those 20 years, I've spent 16 years either practicing law or in legal technology with national law firms. I've also spent uh, four years with the New South Wales Justice Department and in parallel two years in IT managed services. I bring a traditional IT management approach and focus to my roles. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. Thank you, Michael. And Mike Wilkinson, you're our Director of Security Intelligence at NewX. Can you give us a little bit of background of your skills? Yeah, sure, Angela. Uh, thanks for having me on today. I have a range of quite a varied background. Actually, I've spent some time with the New South Wales Police Force um, as a senior civilian in their digital forensics lab. Uh, I've taught uh, at universities in Australia and the US. More recently, I was the head of instant response for Trustwave Spider Labs in APAC and EMEA, and now I have joined NUIX. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, and of course, I'm Angela Bunting, our Vice President of eDiscovery. So at NUIX, we're seeing more and more in the industry previously separate or siloed disciplines now converging, or at least collaborating more as a result of the information imperative. Things like technology advancing at an alarming rate, we've all heard this. Google fast societal expectations. You know, everyone is expecting everything as fast as a Google search these days. There's enormous amounts of data. I think no one needs to be told that anymore, and it's growing and growing by the day. Uh, things getting lost and damaged and stolen. Very, very easy to misplace data or um, damage data these days when it's not a physical item. And IT is focused on systems, legal is focused on the law, but they are both bound by data. So Michael Jones, are you seeing this more and more in your experiences? Would you agree that IT and legal disciplines are now coming together more in the quest of good information governance, you know, management and security? Yes, look, I'd certainly agree they're coming together. Uh, in, interestingly enough, in my various roles, I've reported directly to the CIO, um, so you can see the synergy between my legal background and the IT background. And of course, there is a synergy between, and, and I should say a codependency between legal practice and IT, and that is now almost complete. Today's legal practice cannot function without IT platforms and software, and the future of legal practice is dependent upon IT innovation. 
Yes, they're certainly bound by the data. Virtually all information today is now available digitally and the volume of that inf information is increasing at, a, at an extraordinary rate. My group recently had its first terabyte discovery. That's over five million documents that we receive from our clients. Great. Well, let's dig in and take a bit of a look at why this is such a big deal. Michael Wickelson, do you want to take us through the insider threat? You know, who is it that is on the rise in insiders? Yeah, sure, Angela. So what we have here is just a bit of information on the, the threat landscape, if you will. We're having a look at, at data from a couple of different reports today, one from the Verizon Data Breach Report and another one from Vormetric. So the statistics in, in the Verizon Data Breach Report are really interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're based on, on real cases, real investigations that Verizon have been involved in and secondly, because uh, it's not just Verizon and, and their investigations that are contributed, but they actually are, are pulling data and get data fed to them from a huge range of different sources. So consulting firms such as Deloitte's, computer emergency response teams all around the world, law enforcement, antivirus vendors, other security companies are all providing information to Verizon which they then put into their report. Um, so this is, is giving us a really accurate data on where the problem is and what the pro problem is caused by. So in this case, data is, or the, the incidents are, are classified into two different types. We have incidents alone and breaches. With incidents, we're talking about cases where data has been impacted in some way, but it hasn't actually been confirmed that the data has actually left the organisation and got into an attacker's hands. In a breach, we actually have situations where it has been confirmed that you know, security has been compromised and data has actually been lost and has been ended up in the hands of someone that's going to be using it for some sort of nefarious purpose. So you can look at, look at the numbers. Um, obviously, the breaches are much lower than incidents. Having said that, incidents are still a major point of concern and in some cases, for example, if a laptop is stolen, that would count as an incident but not as a breach because we don't know whether the data itself actually ended up in, in the hands of the attacker. Now, if we actually look at incidents, we can see miscellaneous errors is the, the top cause for incidents. And that's really concerning because that's basically saying the systems and processes in place either were not followed or were not effective and human error was basically allowed to cause data to be lost. Next to that, we have privilege misuse, which directly ties into the insider threat issue. Now, people are abusing their ability to access the data in order to either maliciously or just accidentally lose control of it. And then we go on and it's again physical theft and loss. Again, another insider threat issue as people aren't taking care of the data that they should be. The rest of the, the incidents are more related to external threats that are sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. When we talk about breaches, um, you can see web application attacks is, is probably is the biggest concern or the biggest source of data loss at this point in time and then followed up by point of sale intrusions and really that's driven by um, organisations or criminal organisations specifically targeted value, uh, data of value that they can turn around and generate revenue from. But what we're starting to see is actual increases in some of the internal threats as well. The next top three, miscellaneous errors, privilege misuse and cyber espionage are all directly related to the internal threats where people from inside the organisation allowing or enabling actual data exfiltration. Thanks Mike. It certainly sounds like her inside the threat is, is much a bigger deal than what we originally thought in terms of uh, cyber breaches and um, outside attacks. If we have a look at the next slide, you know, I was very surprised about this. You know, can you take us through you know, what makes up the who in terms of an insider? Yeah, absolutely. So, so surprisingly here, and, and this is the thing that, that people really don't like to think about. You know, as an employer, the thought that your staff may be you know, doing the wrong thing by your organisation, they may be maliciously stealing data from you, is, is not a nice thought. And surprisingly here, we can see with our insider threat statistics, 
And when we talk about insider threats, we're, we're not just talking about deliberate actions by internal users, we're talking accidental actions by internal users, and also situations where external attackers are actually able to gain access um, to internal users' credentials, which actually broadens that, that scope out quite significantly. But in 77% of cases, uh, the actions are a direct result of an internal user doing something they shouldn't, um, which it really is a bit of a, a tragedy. Michael Jones, does this breakdown surprise you? Do you think it has surprised many of your clients? It does surprise our clients. It does not surprise IT staff. Just re-emphasising what Michael Wilkinson covered, there is absolutely a disconnect between what management and staff perceive as the greatest risk. The media loves to dramatise the external threat. The foreign government's intent on espionage or stealing of trade secrets, the Russian hacker intent on distributing crypto locker, or the Nigerian royalty intent on stealing your heart and emptying your bank account. That's what the media likes to capture and focus on. But the CIO and IT staff know statistically where the most likely th threat lies, and that is internal. The people, and these are the people that are already behind your firewall, the people that are already on your network. They're accessing and modifying your data on a day-to-day -day basis. And as Mike pointed out, the risk does not always derive from a deliberately malicious act, or what I call an act of commission. It could also be an act of omission that is a mistake or an accident. Great. Great. So, Michael Wilkinson, you know, the threat is on the rise. Um, can you take us through why that is and, and what we're seeing over the last sort of six, seven years? Absolutely. And, and really, it, it comes down to where the money is. You know, people taking malicious acts, for the most part, are, are driven by financial motivation. And obviously, more and more information is, is stored online, and it's more and more possible these days to make lots of money um, by gaining access to that data. So what we have here on, on this graph is we can actually see the different motivations for breaches. And we can see, rather disturbingly, that the pure financial motivation for a breach is actually being, appears to have been dropping, whilst the espionage motivation has actually been increasing. Now when we talk about financial motivation, we're talking about um, the attackers themselves seeking to steal data um, and then make a direct profit from it. Um, in an internal case, an example of that is where, where staff maybe create internal employees um, or fake employees in an organisation, have them paid, um, you know, get them into the payroll system. Employees, employers are just paying these salaries as part of the, the regular payroll run, um, and then the employee is suddenly getting you know, two pays or three pays, um, and that is, is actually surprisingly common. I was talking to a friend of mine um, in another organisation who had just done an audit and actually found that they had two mystery employees um, that had been receiving salaries for about five years. Um, other examples um, of that internal loss of data. It could be things like stealing credit card information to sell on the black market. Other cases are not so obvious. Uh, there's a case in California where hospital registrars were actually stealing patient information from patients that were brought, brought into the emergency department and actually selling it on to firms who would then come into the hospital, pretend they were actually worked for the hospital and start referring services to these patients. You know, saying, oh, here's a, a patient transport service you might be interested in, here are some legal services you might be interested in. And so the, these different uses and, and different ways staff can actually abuse that their access are, are really wide and varied. Um, from the espionage side of things, um, there's you know, your traditional cloak and dagger type use or type of event, you know, which you might see on movies like The Born Identity. Um, in reality, we're not entirely sure how often they occur, um, and obviously the, the China threat is one that, that everyone is fairly well aware of. A um, classic case relating to that was uh, Dong Fang Chong, um, who was a Boeing employee, um, was found guilty of, of actually stealing trade secrets from Boeing, in, including information on the space shuttle program um, and feeding all that back to, to China. But what we're seeing is, is a rise in corporate espionage where different organisations are actually seeking to gain access to their competitors' information. Uh, there are actually a number of, of websites 
um, on the, the dark web or the, the underground web where you can log on and there are hackers for hire um, and you just pay your money. You say, right, I want as much information as you can gather on this company. Um, this is how much I'm prepared to pay you and then the attacker will go in, gain access to that organisation and collect the information. Um, and what we're seeing even more disturbing from the insider perspective is that we're starting to see people getting corrupted, either offered bribes to, to gain access to that internal information. Um, or every now and then, and you can see here we sort of talk about the grudge, the fun, the ideological reasons, um, and they have been increasing a little bit over time, but not really significantly. I think the, the most recent uh, corporate and espionage case that's the most public at the moment is the um, it was a superconductor case out of out of the US where one of their top directors stole the IP uh, or the patents for that particular company and they sent it broke basically because the Chinese their, their biggest um, customer in China uh, bribed this gentleman to do it um, so it certainly can destroy companies. Michael, do you think um, that financial uh, incentives are actually on the decline or do you think perhaps this graph is indicative of, of insider threat growing uh, as, a, as a bulk and therefore it's sort of converging in that way? Michael yeah, Wilkinson. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, and, and that's one of the, I guess, one of the, the weaknesses of the data in this particular case is, is that Verizon have been collecting this over a, a long period of time, but the sources they've been collecting it from have changed over time. The volume of attacks we're seeing has grown exponentially um, over the past seven years. So potentially what we're actually seeing is you know, financial motivation and direct financial motivation remaining constant whilst the espionage side has been increasing. Um, but either way, it, it's a really big problem and, and a concerning problem. Okay. It certainly does sound like it's the, the soft belly of the corporate world at the moment. Now, if we have a look at the house, you, you kind of glossed over these a little earlier, but let's have a look at of really what an insider threat is made up of in terms of, of how it's coming about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the biggest factor here um, is, is privilege abuse, which is a pretty broad term, but basically it means you know, staff abusing or, or I guess abusing um, access to data they have as part of their everyday work. And one of the really disturbing statistics, which we, we haven't actually put up on the screen for you, um, is that of all these insider cases, only 14% have been as a result um, or from people in senior management positions. And the other 14% or another 14% are from people with super user type access to the environment, so database administrators and system administrators, um, so your IT type staff. Um, the rest of it is coming from people in just you know, general staff positions who just have access to this sensitive information as part of their day-to-day their -day job and are then able to exfiltrate it from the organisation. And the problem with that is that it makes it very hard to detect um, because people have access to this data you know, as part of what they do every day, it's hard to tell when the access um, they, they are making with that data um, or the way they're accessing that data is actually for a malicious purpose rather than just part of their regular duties. Um, in terms of the other factors that get involved in, the, in these breaches, um, again, data mishandling, and, and that's a really scary one for me because that's something that's actually, you know, should be fairly easy to address um, just by having the right processes in place, especially if you're talking e-discovery um, and, and forensics. Other aspects of it, you know, unapproved hardware, unapproved software getting introduced to the environment. Um, and those sort of cases, what you're talking about is people that are seeking and generally to try and get around um, the, the current restrictions on the levels of access they have um, and quite often people do that because they need access to, to do their job properly or they think they need access to their job properly and it's just too hard to go about getting permission and working out how to do it in the right way. 
Um, so a lot of this comes down to making sure that you have the right systems and procedures in place, making sure that people have access to the data that they need, but not to data that they don't, and also making sure that your employees are educated and ensuring that um, the access that people do have to sensitive data is actually monitored and recorded. So Michael Jones, I'd imagine data mishandling is quite a common issue for data collected in discovery situations. Um, since it's outside its usual environment. Did you want to add a comment to there? Yeah, electronic discovery represents a very unique threat. The data we're talking about is client sensitive data in, in most cases. It could be IP, it could be trade secrets, it could be financial information, it could be HR and personal information. And as you said in your opening, it's, it's information that's relevant to a discovery, so it could be critical in relation to the tactical nature of that, uh, that case before the court. Your client probably already has information government policies. They probably have solid cyber security, uh, industry security certifications and classifications. But in the context of a discovery, they are facilitating outsiders coming into their, their network, into their systems, into their very data centers to access virtually anything, to extract what is needed en masse and to take it out on external hard drives, to take it off site and to take it out of the client's control. The data may then be physically relocated and stored. It may be transferred to third-party service providers, possibly even transferred overseas to other jurisdictions. I think there's no other scenario where a business would let that occur, and it represents a unique vulnerability. Nevertheless, solid policies and procedures manage that risk, and in my experience, mishandling is actually uncommon. Okay, great. Um, the time to discovery is something that I think people don't have a good concept of and it seems to be increasing, Michael Wilkinson. Did you want to take us through what we're seeing here? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this is something that I guess I've encountered on a regular occasion um, conducting investigations and what we see, and unfortunately from the insider threat perspective, this isn't something that, that's changing significantly over time, is how long it takes for an actual compromise to be detected. Um, and generally, inside a threat case, you're talking months or even years uh, for the majority of cases. You can see here we're looking at 70% um, you know, of cases um, are, are a month or months or years before they're actually detected. And generally, they're detected because that sensitive data has actually made it into the public domain. They're not actually detected as part of the routine security monitoring um, and the protections that are in place within the organisation. The ones that are detected in hours and days, um, which is only 10% last year, um, are the ones that are actually detected um, by internal systems for the most part. From, from my perspective, in my experience, statistics I've collected on investigations, you're looking at about an average of 80 days um, between the, the point of compromise or the, the point of loss of data and the point of the compromise actually being detected. Um, and with insider breaches, as I said before, it's, it's really hard to detect because a lot of the time the access that people have is just part of their routine day-to-day -day activity. Okay. And I think um, the perception of where the risk lies is another thing too, especially with IT teams. Um, did you want to take us through this slide? I think it was quite quite interesting to see the perception against actual risk. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this one, this data here is taken from the Volmetric um, Insider Threat Report. And for their study, they actually turned around and interviewed um, CIOs uh, and other IT professionals um, to see where they thought the greatest risk to their data came from. And what they're comparing here is, is a volume of sensitive data stored in these different locations to compared to the perceived risk um, of staff to data within that environment. Um, and so we can see here that most sensitive data is stored in databases or on file servers. And they are both considered to be of you know, reasonably high risk, um, but certainly the, the level of concern and, and the risk perception on them is below the actual risk. And that's certainly something I've seen time and time again in, in conducting investigations where databases are, are vulnerable um, and, and generally exposed 
Um, I mean, exposed via web servers is probably the most common thing where you have SQL injection attacks available. Um, and if you look at, say, the TalkTalk Talk case um, or the, the PacNet case, um, where people were actually able to you know, log into the website and gain access to the, the back-end database and just download nearly you know, the entire database um, via the web server. Um, file servers comes down to a, a couple of things, you know, access controls on the file servers, but also the way the information is actually stored on those file servers. Um, the other really depressingly common thing I see, um, which is really a combination of these two factors, is database backups that get stored in an insecure location. Um, so the attacker gets access to the organisation's network and they're able to just pick up a copy um, of the database backup, which is, is really, you know, majority of what's in the database is going to be sensitive data because that's all your business processes. The other interesting thing is the perceived threat and risk to your PCs and workstations um, and to your mobile devices. Now that perceived risk is very high. Um, in reality, there's not actually a lot of sensitive information that, that's stored on those devices in the majority of cases. Yeah. Um, so it's important that you protect and secure those devices, but you should be spending just as much effort protecting and securing the data where it is actually stored. Um, and that's really when you look at, at conducting a security audit, audit or implementing a security plan, the first step is to identify where is our, our data of value, where is it actually stored, and where should we be putting our efforts to secure it. So Michael Jones, do you, do you think this is where legal teams have a responsibility to work with IT security to ensure that the perception of risk is higher around client collected data? Yeah, absolutely. As Michael Wilkerson's pointed out, IT knows where the risks lie. We have the statistics, which Michael's been talking to, and we of course have the alerts and the reports. So IT implements all the technical security framework and the infrastructure. They develop the policies and then they need to work with the legal teams, I suppose from, from management down, to educate and to obtain compliance. Great. So, look, in addition to insider threats increasing in number and consequence, you know, e-discovery itself isn't becoming any easier. You know, this graphic has, has been around for about 10 years now, but you know, the process is still fraught with opportunities for breakdowns in security. Michael Jones, as an expert in e-discovery, you know, someone who assists clients on a daily basis to build and improve on their ED programs and processes, what are some of the complexities of discovery that we should be on the lookout for in context of exasperating risk of improper data disclosure? Well, we've identified the inherent risk involved in discovery, and that is that we're dealing with client-sensitive data that's outside of its normal secure environment and it's often in, in a very portable and transportable uh, medium. It's then distributed to multiple parties for complex processing. There's lots of hands on the data. It's often in the context of significant time pressures where there's a greater risk of errors, um, and that's the acts of omission that we talked about. By way of example, my team has received in the past from other parties to an action hard drives that have not been properly wiped, and that it contains sensitive data from their previous client matters. Now, one can only imagine what might have happened if that information had fallen into the wrong hands. With e-discovery, there's also an emphasis on defensible discovery and preservation of the evidentiary value of data, not necessarily a focus on security per se. So that's where IT departments and groups like my own play a key role in the management and overseeing of that data. Great. And look, I guess we can't do this webinar without talking about the Panama Papers and while it's still a lot of speculation out there as to where the source got their information, there's a lot of speculation around this was potentially an insider threat and you know, it, w it was an act of um, wanting to make things right and it was a lot of data to pull out of a, a firm and again, you know, it was a database that was primarily the, the main source of these records. So it is speculation, I guess, but um, certainly a very big example of a firm that's suffering a lot of backlash at the moment and I'm not sure if this happened to many corporations these days or law firms these days, whether they'd be able to come back from such a, a massive feat. 
So in terms of addressing the threat, yeah, it really does come down to, to people, process and technology. You know, having a holistic, programmatic um, approach to security. Uh, it has to be consistent and defensible. Michael Jones, you've, you've said that before. And looking at an integrated overall corporate information governance strategy and security framework. So Michael Jones, is inside a threat an IT problem or is it first and foremost a people problem? It's a people problem. Or more specifically, uh, it's a management and a HR problem. Um, as I stated, I see IT sets the framework and the policy that they have to be implemented and they have to be enforced. So just looking at the slide, perhaps the first step in the process is vetting your personnel. Now that's obviously domestic or international, whatever the context, and that's all part and parcel of the HR induction process. So the proper background checks, the appropriate um, referee checks. Also, you need to vet every person that is involved in the process. We've already spoken about how there's many hands on the data. So you need to vet your vendors, you need to vet your contractors, and your business partners. It's um, barely worth mentioning that it's essential to have in place confidentiality agreements, to have the appropriate policies, uh, compliance with those policies, also to have the monitoring in place to ensure compliance with those policies, and obviously access control. Uh, and that is a very important thing because in some cases, some contexts, people have extraordinary access, and that's your higher level IT staff. Flying on from that is the need to constantly reassess uh, the vetting process and the monitoring process. You may wish to do that at fixed intervals. You may wish to do that at key uh, dates in relation to the project status. There might be a change in status, might be people coming into the project, there might be people leaving the project. One thing the industry has shown us that overworked IT managers quite often overlook regular updates in relation to access privileges. So you might find you've got lists of names of people who have moved on into other capacities still have access that, that they no longer need, and dare I say it, the people that might have left the firm still have access um, when they certainly no longer need it. Also, you have to consider what about uh, when an employee changes their role, they might get a promotion or a transfer, and perhaps one of the most obvious but key things to focus on is when there are HR issues around an employee. So if they are starting to display signs of distress or disgruntled behaviour, and of course, if you're going through a performance management or indeed a conduct management process, then you have to be particularly diligent. There's good reason why where you've had to take decisive action in relation to staff members from a HR perspective, that in some cases people are uh, marched off the premises with security in tow with no notice. That's to minimise the risk. Okay. And Moving on to the next slide. There's also a need to educate employees and affiliates of the risk. So there's an ongoing piece in relation to the policy and procedures, and we do that um, as a matter of course here at Minters, and that's making sure your staff are aware of their own personal contractual provisions under all their agreements that they've signed off on. Of course, education and onboarding in relation to the commencement of projects, but also keeping that up to date and doing it on a regular basis. And that training should include acceptable use of data, proper data handling processes, which I'll talk to a little bit more shortly. Of course, the duty to report, so um, point out where people have um, mishandled data, whether deliberately or, or incorrectly, so that they can be addressed and uh, processes and procedures can be updated. Um, you must constantly uh, emphasise the expectation, uh, exp expectation of privacy and you should enforce disciplinary action for non-compliance. And as an ongoing, you should have e-discovery, personnel-specific training in relation to the acute vulnerabilities represented by e-discovery. So, Michael Wilkinson, in your broad experience, have you found that this training provides an ROI in terms of creating an organisational culture that is less likely to allow insider threat activities to go unnoticed? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I mean, the, the challenge is always d delivering the training in, in a manner in which people are, are I guess, open to it um, and creating the right culture is, I guess, the hard part. Um, but certainly, it's very obvious when you are working with an organisation that actually has an appreciation of the security risks um, and have actually taken the effort to make sure their, their staff are aware of the sensitivity of, the, of what they are handling. Um, and the importance of their role in the organisation. 
Great. Michael Jones, so extending that further into the legal and regulatory exercises that are found in discovery, what else should we be considering? Okay, well it's all about policies, so I'll just give a brief description as to what we do at Minter Allison within my group, Project Services. So we have policies around data preservation and collection. We apply a detailed project management methodology from start to finish. We have what we call gatekeepers who are tasked with the chain of custody of the data. We also have detailed tracking and data logs. We have a sign-in and a sign-out process. We have redundant processes and secondary checks, so we make sure we're not just reliant upon single individuals to comply. We have our secondary layers of checking to make sure everything is complied with. In relation to physical data management, when it's on those portable hard drives, um, we make sure when they're on site, they're in a sub-secured premises, and not only are they within our secured business premises, they're also secured within our premises separately. We ensure all hard drives are encrypted to industry standards. That adds a bit of cost and time, but we consider it to be essential. Uh, we make sure we do all secure file transfers. We never use um, unencrypted email. And of course, we make sure we comply with safe destruction of hard drives. For the sake of trying to uh, reuse a $100 hard drive, I'd rather have that hard drive destroyed satisfactorily than risk that there might have been some issue with deletion of data. Moving on to the next slide, when the data is now virtual, we of course make sure it's secured on our network so it's behind all of our firewalls are subject to our industry certifications, classifications and cyber security policies. And even within our network it's partitioned and secured so it's not available to the firm at large. We also consider our cloud service providers in this day and age. We rely very heavily on external service providers um, to provide the best value and quality services, services in their niche. And of course we go through a detailed vetting process in relation to those cloud service providers. We've just recently completed that process from top to bottom in relation to our cloud service providers. We vet for their cyber security compliance. We make sure they've got industry certification and classification. We also make sure they've got cyber insurance. But it's important to note that even when the data is with service providers, the risk does not shift. It still remains with us. So we have to make sure they comply with our standards of certification. And then there's considerable issues to consider in relation to the offshoring of data. In many circumstances, there are a lot of economic imperatives and time imperatives to utilise global resourcing. Uh, and with that, you have issues around jurisdiction, should there be complexities, and you have issues around legislative compliance. Okay, so Michael Jones, it sounds like you know, there's some basic questions that we should be asking to ensure that our policies cover and help employees understand their obligations. Did you want to run through some of those questions? Yeah, sure. Look, some of the questions to think about on this slide, which is who's collecting the data? Where is the data stored? We talked about some of the approaches to that. Uh, who has access to it? Where does the data reside when it's being processed? And that's often what it could be with third parties. How should we transport, it, transport the data to third parties? Should we move it physically on hard drives? Should we send it over secure encrypted networks? Who are the people authorised to receive and work with the data? Remember, some of those people might not be within your own organisation. Is the data or media encrypted? And who in the organisation is accountable for monitoring and overseeing the process? We talked about having gatekeepers and secondary um, considerations or assessments of the process. Great, and I think all of those questions, if you can uh, account for the, the answers for those, will be a great starting point to what sounds like uh, a fantastic policy range from the program that Minters have put in place. So Michael Wilkinson, yeah, to sum up, yeah, from a technology side, what should we be considering to ensure that we mitigate the threat of insiders, whether they be intentional or not? Yeah, so I mean, and this really ties back to, to the series of questions that, uh, that Michael was just talking about. But first of all, you've got to know where your data is um, and, and where is your data, um, or your sensitive information that may be of value to an attacker, um, where is it stored? And really for modern businesses, um, you know, data is the, the core of your business. So you should know where it is. And that's something that is, is surprisingly common um, 
that, that people either don't know where their data is um, or are taking inappropriate methods um, in, in handling of it. Um, but the other thing I, I see far too often is um, old systems that should have been retired are still left running um, and then they end up getting compromised and either serve as a, a jump point um, of access into the organisation's network um, or old data actually of still of value, an, an old sensitive data, just it's not used anymore by the organisation but it's, it's still sensitive information, um, gets left on these old redundant systems but it's still online, it's still accessible um, and then it ends up getting compromised and exfiltrated at that point. The next thing, once you know where your data is, is actually knowing who is having access to it. So you need to be able to manage your user accounts. Um, and again, that ties back into the user education so that users don't create you know, one logon for an application and just share it around everyone so everyone's using that, that same logon. Um, you know, every user should have their own unique username. Um, they need to make sure they're using good passwords, um, ideally two-factor authentication. Um, and you know, you, that actually gives you the ability to track what everyone is doing and also access control, which is, is the next point. Um, you know, people should only have access to what they need. Uh, if someone is working on one case, that's the data they should have access to. They don't need to have access to every other case in the organisation. Um, and then we look at methods of exfiltration. How are people accessing the data? Is it possible for people to just you know, download it to a, to a USB drive and, and walk it out. And that's probably the, these days with the high level of connectivity um, that's expected and, and that we have available to us is you know, quite difficult to enforce and manage. Um, you know, it's easy to transfer stuff out via Dropbox or Google Drive, um, email stuff out via Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo Mail or whatever other cloud service provider you want to use. Um, so actually controlling that, having good firewall policies and everything else in place is also really important. Once you have your access controls and your control methods in place, you actually want to be monitoring and making sure that data isn't leaking out of your defined storage locations. Um, a classic example of that might be HR um, creating spreadsheets of users, of staff I should say, um, and just storing it on their laptops. Um, or maybe deciding, oh yeah, we need to share this and I want to work from home, so I'll just start storing all this stuff on Dropbox. So I, can, I can access this from home. Um, so there's a, there's a range of tools you can use to scan your network for sensitive data and identify if that is somewhere in your network. Um, and then finally, you want to make sure, you know, from a user edu education perspective, um, people are aware of the risks, but also they know who to talk to if they identify a problem. Uh, one thing we have set up here at, at Newix is just an email address um, that everyone knows if they see a security issue um, or a potential security issue, they send an email to that ad address, um, we respond very quickly and you know, it's easy for people to, to raise issues if they do identify them. And often, you know, once staff know that they can raise these issues, um, you know, they're aware, they have been aware of, of issues previously. Um, they maybe just haven't known who to report it to. If you make it really easy for them to report the issues, um, you will find that you do start finding out about them. And finally, um, you want to make sure you're treating your staff well. You know, we're talking about insider threats here. Um, if, if staff are disgruntled, if staff are disengaged from your organisation, they're obviously far more likely to do things that they shouldn't. Um, so you want to engender a bit of staff loyalty by taking care of them. Michael Wilkinson, I think you raised a really good point there and one that um, I, I'd like to reiterate you. In terms of being able to raise things, you know, not everyone is technology minded here at Newix, you know, we're a technology company and we do have quite a few te technical people that can look at these things and say, well, that's not quite right. But it gives them a safe harbour if they're not technically minded, I think, to have and address it. If it looks a little suspicious, there's no, nothing wrong with raising something that you're not sure of. There's no dumb questions when it comes to security. And I think we've seen that here at Newix where a lot more um, items are being raised and while they may not be malicious, some of them have been. And 
yeah, it, it's very, very easy now to have that culture of there's never a dumb thing to put forward to that email address. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing. It, it's really making sure that, um, and especially, I mean, I guess one of the challenges is always with IT staff and IT security staff, present company excluded, of course, is that you do tend to get people that are maybe a little socially challenged um, in, in some of those roles. Um, and it's really important that, that you know, the staff responding to user requests are also treating that, those, those users or those staff um, with respect. Okay, so Michael Joes, you know, in summary, specifically when dealing with the discovery and sensitive client data, what are your recommendations in terms of addressing the threat? Sure, well this is somewhat of a summary. So going over some of the ground that I've covered and, and that Michael Wilkinson has covered, you need to have access controls, you need to have proper data preservation and collection approaches, a good project management methodology that addresses the chain of custody, um, obviously policies and procedures around dealing with client data. Um, I've talked about gatekeepers, um, we both talked about the chain of custody. We talked about having uh, logs and tracking, and we, we talked about having redundant processes and secondary checks and monitoring those processes. And of course at the end having a review and update. Great, thank you. Look, we're almost at wrap up point, so I guess I'd like to give our panellists an opportunity to provide some closing thoughts. Yeah, is there something that you'd like to, to cover, to make sure of, to mention, um, something to look forward to in the future, say in the next 12 months or five years? Michael Jones, your thoughts? Well, perhaps it's not something to look forward to. Look, the Panama Papers, which we started this webinar um, referring to, and you mentioned it also part way through, is interesting because it, it demonstrates the potential gravity of a, of a breach. There's a debate, of course, whether to, uh, as to whether it was an insider job or an external hack. In my opinion, even if it was an external hack, it, it succeeded because of the emissions of their internal IT department, who used unencrypted emails, they were running a three-year-old version of Drupal content management, and they had an inherently insecure network architecture. So I call that an act of emission. The Panama Papers also taught us that there is no cure. Prevention is essential. You cannot withdraw the data once it's out there. And indeed, concepts such as the Streisand effects um, indicate that the harder you try to cover things up or leaks up, the worse uh, the effect will be and the further it will go. I'd like to make an unfortunate prediction. Uh, I believe within the Australian legal industry, there will be a loss of client-sensitive data probably in the next five years. It won't be from a firm such as Minters because of the um, considerable effort we put into managing um, the issues around secured client data, but it may happen in, in, within the industry at large. And data will be lost, um, and we've already identified what are the most likely causes, and that's an insider, and the most likely um, cause will be uh, an active emission. So I predict that perhaps there will be a hard drive that's lost or a uh, unsecure, misplaced laptop. Yeah, I think it's it's more of a, a matter of not if, but when. I, I, I really believe that with, with insider threat, and I'm not sure that uh, every firm could come back from it in such a way as um, Masaka uh, Fonseca has. Michael Wilkinson, anything you would like to add? Yeah, look, I think, I, I mean, first obviously I, I totally agree with Michael. Um, and uh, slightly, I guess, more depressingly maybe, if, if you look at the actual detection rates um, or detection time, I should say, between when the event occurs and when it's actually detected, um, it's entirely possible something happened last year and we're not going to hear about it until next year. The other side of it is that historically there have been lots of, of ways that criminals can make money online. and the classic method has actually been credit card fraud. That's something I've spent really the past three years investigating with, with Trustwave. And we're actually starting to see a decline in the value of, of credit cards as a source of, of revenue. You know, it costs a couple of cents. If, if you've got a full set of credit card data, it's now really worth less than a dollar per card. 
So what we're starting to see now is trends where people are looking at other ways of making money online, or criminals I should say, are looking at other ways of making money online. So I think we're actually going to start seeing different types of compromises, different types of data being targeted. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'm also sorry to be, be finishing on a depressing note, but you know, data is, is value, it is the, the core business or the, you know, the crown jewels of many organisations and we really need to be doing a better job of protecting it. I think we do and, uh, and the good note in that is that my credit cards aren't worth that much anymore which is fantastic. In terms of questions, yeah, if anyone would like to ask some questions, we've had a few flow through as we're going through, please feel free to type them into the little chat box within your, your webinar login and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them as we go along. So the first question um, relates to a previous slide, so I'm, I might just take it back to that particular slide. And we were asked, what is the little grey bars in this particular uh, uh, graphs? Michael Wilkinson, I believe you've been doing a little bit of research and, and have an answer. Uh, yes, grey bar question. That is actually where those figures were in last year's report. Um, so you can actually see there has been quite a bit of change from one year to the next on those, both in, in terms of different types of breaches um, and different types of incidents. Um, now the next one relates, next question relates to the next slide which we'll tag on to. And it, it says, does the 77% for insiders and corporate employees who have been co-opted by an external actor? So Michael Wilkinson, did you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, no, they don't. So the external, so where you have an internal insider who's actually working um, with someone externally, or you have insiders working in collusion, they're actually covered by that external and collusion statistics there. So that 75% is purely internal actors basically acting on their own, um, which is, is really scary, and perhaps even scarier <laughs> than uh, it would otherwise be. Okay, uh, the next question. Um, the next question says, you know, are there any estimates on what proportion of compromises remain undetected? It's a bit of a fairly one. Michael Wilkinson? Yeah, it is, and that's actually a, a really good question. And to be honest, it isn't one that I've thought of before. Thinking about it, we could potentially extrapolate based on the rising number of compromises and then the delay between detection and identification. But there's also, and I'm, I'm going to start sounding a little too geeky here and, and, and analytical, but the other thing is that we're also seeing an increase in people actually acknowledging a compromise um, where historically organisations were generally quite reluctant to actually reveal the fact that they had had a breach due to compulsory disclosure laws in a lot of countries now. Um, we're seeing a lot more acknowledgement of compromises which would also lead to the number of, of compromises being reported increasing. So I'm probably going to go away and do some homework and see if, if we can extrapolate that from the information available. But at this point in time, we don't have any of, of that information. Okay. On that question, I think it's interesting to note that, yeah, there probably is a proportion of compromises that, that are, remain unannounced for obvious commercial reasons. I don't think there are too many compromises from my IT background that are undetected. Um, but as I said, they might not be disclosed. But what is often in interesting from an IT perspective is, of course, our clients don't think we're doing much or our systems are very active until something goes wrong. But it is actually very worthwhile providing the intrusion logs or the um, threat um, prevention logs to our clients every now and then to let them know what extraordinary amount of traffic there is out there on the internet uh, in relation to people trying to, to um, defeat the IT defences of, of uh, major commercial entities uh, and the volume is, is enormous. It, literally there are hundreds of threats detected on a daily basis. And actually I might just chime in there in, in terms of uh, um, compromises getting reported. Um, over the past few years I've been involved in investigating probably at least 200 cases of, of compromises in Australia 
um, or of Australian companies, and of those, only two of them were actually reported um, to customers, and I think only one of them actually made it into the media. So you're looking at you know, less than one percent of compromises in Australia are actually getting reported. Mm, that's an interesting statistic. I, I wonder if the um, new mandatory privacy reporting will make a difference to that figure and, and whether we'll get a better sense of what's to come. So I think that's all the questions we have for the moment. Um, of course, yeah, thank you very much for attending our, our webinar today. If you, if you have any more questions or would like some more information on this particular topic, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to Newix or to the panellists today. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to Michael Jones and Michael Wilkinson for joining me today on this, this very important topic. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Angela, and thanks, thanks everyone for tuning in. <laughs>